Are your programmers even programming? I grew up in the world of simple programming, where every line of code is executed one by one. But in the age of internet, eh, we really wouldn't want to wait for an image to finish downloading before we could scroll the web page. Therefore, multiple branching flows of a single program are required. Yikes! Whenever it makes sense, in the world of modern programming, you can begin an operation and let code continue executing without waiting for it to finish. Your program will run at the same time in multiple places, growing like the branches of a tree. In JavaScript, syntactic sugar was introduced with promises. You could say, promise all, and wait for all operations to finish, collapsing all the branches into a single point. And shortly thereafter, you could await a promise to complete with the await keyword, pretending that you are, in fact, in a simple world of the old school, which made code so much easier to read. As now, a simple branching program could be launched on one line, and right below it, as if it was the next line of code, which it isn't, set the callback without any brackets, without any strange indentation, no fluent notation. It was just the next line of code. But it's actually the callback, the thing that's waiting for the operation to complete, except that it's presented as the next line. Wow, the readability of code improved so much. You could branch your program, but it would look normal. But you know how it is, promise all aside, when you start branching anything, everything all of a sudden becomes chaos. Programming is already kind of hard. Now, with multiple parts of your program running whenever they feel like it, it gets a lot worse. It is beautiful, but very, very scary. The pre-promise, pre-async world would often be referred to as callback hell because you would have to nest functions within functions and functions within functions. Great Ronin Samurai were experimenting with certain patterns that would go around callbacks, even without the async keyword. And they found something. It probably comes from distant languages, maybe Erlang, maybe something before that. But it works. And when paired with the beautiful asynchronous execution syntax, code becomes rather beautiful and powerful. Let me put it this way, it's so powerful that it's been sitting in the browser, hidden, silent, and freaking unchanged as all the other technologies we're developing. All the way up to AI, we still don't want to change it. We embrace it, we make it better with frameworks, but we would not dare to change it. I recognize this as the actor model. It is just data networks, but they were anthropomorphized to help us navigate. They look much different inside the web browser, but that's where the idea comes from, probably. The actor model is still just streams of data. It's actually rather revolutionary. 
it is common that you don't have different types of actors, not at first. Your entire network is just actors sending data to one another. To do something with that data, you assign a function to the actor. So you first build the pipeline of how everything flows through your network, similar to how pneumatic pipelines of 1950s would be built during the actual development of the bank or the building that will house the bank. They first put in the pipeline and then moved in the different departments. Once you have the network up and operational, you give a script for the actor to read. The method is often called become, so that an actor becomes a file transformer, becomes a text transformer to uppercase, becomes a file save destination or sync. So, if you need an actor in your network that saves data to a file, first you map out your network, maybe give your actors nice and informative names like read file from the internet, spell check data, zip data, save file. And then you say, hey, zip, become this function. And that's when you give your actors programming, you assign it later. This is very significant, because one, this allows you to describe your function, what the inputs are, what the outputs are, so that you have a test. And just having that test will give you an idea of how complete your program is. You just run all the tests on your well-named nodes and they will report incomplete or complete or have bugs or need more programming. But more importantly, the significance is in artificial intelligence today. Because personally, and I think there are many others, I am not entirely convinced that we need to program the functions that the actors become. I think we can just describe them for the AI. And because networks are divided in such small pieces, the AI won't have trouble generating those functions. And then you have your test to see if the function that the AI generated passes it. Then you run your, how far along are we test, you know, and you may see that you're 99% along and you haven't done any programming and you haven't hired any programmers. It was just your in-house old Llama Llama 3.1 that did all the work. Very interesting. Very significant. And don't tell me that the AI is going to get confused here. These functions often run 20, 50 lines of code. This is good stuff. This is the future. And just to be clear, up until you assign a function to the actor, the data would just flow through the entire network unchanged all the way up to the end node or the sync node that it doesn't send it along any further. So it's like a stream of data. It's fine. It's good. It's a functional network. It just doesn't process its data. This is pretty awesome. But listen, we're just getting started here. This is not yet tough enough. Again, there are so many moving parts to the internet that you can't just hope to read a file from the internet and trust that you're going to get there. In fact, you can't even hope to just initialize your actors because those functions that they become come from the internet or the disk. And that means there is branching involved. Oh yes, promises. 
waiting for a piece of code to finish downloading and then include it in the programming, waiting for it to initialize. So you can't really count on your program just starting. You have to put all your actors on a stage and then have them all report to the stage director. Once they are ready, once they got all their code and configuration and that magical function, actors, the event emitters that they are, emit a ready event. This is extremely similar to how a web page will emit a ready event. A web page also has to fetch its resources and the DOM will tell you when ready. Collapsing all the branches into a, yeah, I'm good, I'm ready for my line now, director. In a visual programming language, to give a better, more visual example, you can't just connect two actors with a line, because they may not have loaded their user interface yet. And you would have nothing to connect that line to, no XY coordinates to track. But if you make that line or cable wait, for a visual component to be ready. You can then be sure all the graphics are there and you can start tracking their position and thus attach the visual programming line. So while promises and awaiting things keeps the code clean, you still need events like ready in larger programs or on higher layers than a function to report when all the branches have done their work and collapse to a single point and are ready to move on to the next stage in your entire application. In summary, actors can map out programs before they accept their roles or that function and they wisely emit events to let each other know when it is safe to keep going forward. But there are two more things, two more things that really make this even more powerful. And this is where we must abandon the concept of simple actors and move on to a higher abstraction, where we only deal with two. The supervisor, which is an actor, and the worker, also an actor. First of all, a supervisor is an actor that receives messages, but it does not do anything to them. It instead puts them in a queue. So a supervisor has a unique property. It is a queue, like a mail queue. Think of it as an old office inbox, if you must. So it's just like a crappy job. A supervisor will intercept a work order and put it in its worker's queue or inbox. Which brings us to the neatest bit now. The supervisor has a worker. And yes, that is that old actor that becomes a function, but we call it a worker now. We give it a proper name instead of just assigning a function later. We now have a read file from the internet worker under the supervision of a powerful job manager. And we can have as many workers as CPUs or CPU cores, as many as servers on some remote execution environment, or as many as necessary. So your computer is fully utilized, your network can be fully utilized or employed, and this is purely the job of the supervisor, the type of a supervisor that you pick. It is trivial to switch supervisors too. So while you are developing your program, you can have just a web worker. But later, as you deploy your program, 
You can just use a serverless environment or some self-scaling and healing network. So a supervisor does not just put jobs on the queue, but wisely dispatches workers and monitors their progress. So it's suited for specific deployment scenarios. And this is that big tough feature. If some download fails or your computer even crashes, the supervisor will still just resume where things broke. It will have jobs marked incomplete in its queue, so it won't even care that it crashed. It will send or resend them to its worker for a download, and darn right it will keep track of time too. It may cancel a stalled download and send a worker to try re-downloading the file again. And all of this happens automatically. All of this is very easy to program inside just a specific supervisor that does one thing well. It is pretty strange to see this beautiful semi-confusing, branching programming leading up to actors, yeah, but you really want to tie off all those diverging branches with a nice and sweet ready event, wrapped in an anthropomorphized piece of code that you can easily imagine in your mind. So an actor is a mnemonic. It makes sense. It collapses complexity. So that when you are tired and desperate to finish your work, you can just think in terms of actors that have ready events and pass along data. Not only do these programs recover from a crash without rerunning event sourcing or some nonsense like that, but you can easily visualize them and they heal themselves. Wow. The supervisors will simply but reliably recover from impossible errors, errors that other programs just don't even try to address. How are you going to automatically retry all your fetch requests? It's not an easy task. It completely alters the flow of the program. In fact, it leads up to the actor model or the better supervisor worker model. So, yeah, it's a little strange, but it's a combination of ideas crafted to help your mind process what's going on and the debug and strategize and continue working on the program. Actors are pretty much black boxes, but they are done right. They are done beautifully. The error recovery is just incredible. And I left the most curious part for last. You know that worker the supervisor is dispatching to do some processing? That can be an interface to a real human being. The supervisor will now wait for a human to do something, maybe solve a captcha, maybe look at some x-rays. And when the human takes care of it and replies to the email or web interface, the supervisor will then mark that job in the queue as done and send the result along to the next supervisor with a worker, be it for saving data or transforming it in some other way again. 